Thank you for joining us today on our Getting Started with Spring Data Neo4j webinar. My name is Allison Sparrow, and I'll be your host. And presenting today, I have Neo Technologies German Division and Principal Lead in Spring Data Neo4j, Michael Hunger. Before I hand over the floor to Michael, I would like to let you all know that this session is being recorded and will be sent out via email tomorrow. We'll also be taking questions towards the end of the webinar, so please be sure to type your questions in the question section of the GoToWebinar window. For all other questions that are not covered, we will post a blog with those questions and answers. All right, Michael, it's now up on to you. Okay, thank you, Alison. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm glad you made it. Good morning. Uh, I want to show you today a quick intro into Spring Data in U4J. I'm, as Alison said, I'm the German Division of Neo Technology, and besides Spring Data and Neo4j, I'm also uh, responsible for the Neo4j cloud hosting. Uh, we got some polls from you um, up front, and so most of you are Java developers. Some have Spring experience, and, and NoSQL is not so familiar, and also just a few of you have worked with Neo4j so far. So um, this uh, will be re really an introductional talk, and I will mainly cover Spring Data and Neo4j, and it's much too much content anyway, so the library is growing kind of every day and adds new features, and uh, I will just uh, speak quickly about NoSQL and Neo4j itself. If you have more questions about Neo4j and NoSQL, then you can find more, much more information on neo4j.org. Um, that's it. So Spring Data Neo4j is part of the Spring Data Project. The Spring Data Project is about bringing the convenience of the Spring framework and Spring development to the NoSQL databases. Quest, first question is, what is NoSQL? So is NoSQL not to SQL? Is it never SQL? No, it's rather not only SQL. Of course, we think that uh, everyone should be able to take informed decisions looking at its data, its data structure and complexity, and choose the right tools for handling this data. And even if you have like uh, disparate data that's differently structured in, in different parts of your domain, then you're also free to choose multiple uh, storage providers for the different types of data and combine them in your application level. So it's actually just about the right tool for the right job and not one size fits all. Quickly, the four main categories of the NoSQL space. Uh, first is key value stores, which are actually large distributed global hash maps, very simple data structures, very fast, very large data sets. Uh, second is column table, um, big table family with Cassandra and HBase, which is, uh, provides a more rigid, more structured uh, way per row. Uh, and next is document databases. Uh, most commonly used are MongoDB and CouchDB, which store uh, documents which are actually trees of elements and offer very, very interesting query capabilities. And last but not least are graph databases, which are the best fit for complex interconnected data and allow you to put the data in there that com comes directly out of your domain without dumbing it down and cutting it up. So if you look at the, the size of the data and the complexity of the data, it's clear that key value stores can handle large sizes, but uh, the data stored there is very simple, and along these lines you see uh, the more complex uh, the data that gets, the less <coughs> you can kind of store efficiently. But on the other hand, even on this uh, chart, uh, the kind of upper level is still billions of elements in your data store, and this covers more than 90% of the use cases, except perhaps the extreme ones like Google, Facebook, and, and Twitter. But even Twitter is not, not so much. So um, why does NoSQL happen now and not like 20 years ago or 10 years ago? Um, it's just um, a thing of trends. So since the Internet started, the, the amount of data has been growing exponentially. The data gets much more complex, much more interconnected. It's not just uh, a single provider that uh, offers the data, but it, it is more and more 
lots of services that offer data in which you connect uh, and derive more complex uh, solutions from. And we all, we've also seen that data is less and less structured, so the more content you get from users, user-generated content and, and from interconnecting services, you get uh, less structure and also kind of um, sparsely filled structure. So even if you def define schemas, then you often get like just a subset of this uh, data filled in. That's especially uh, difficult with relational databases as you then get large uh, tables with sparsely filled columns and have problems with data integrity because all your op uh, relationships would be optional and not uh, enforced. And of course, changes in architecture. So we went from the monolithic uh, applications that had just a single database in the beginning to a more and more interconnected services who often have their own data stores and are just connected by protocols. So that's the trend we've been observing and no simple steps in here to provide um, state-of-the-art data persistence and uh, data storage for those applications. What is Spring Data? Spring Data is an umbrella project uh, introduced by Spring Source that uh, tries to provide uh, the convenience of Java and Spring development for NoSQL data stores. The problem with NoSQL data stores is that most of their APIs are quite low level and you just operate on the, uh, on the actual data level and if you want to have a bit more convenience, for instance, in your object space that you, that you work on in your enterprise or in your application, then uh, kind of raising that level of abstraction is often very welcome by, by developers. But still, it, it doesn't dump down uh, the developer by just, just providing the high-level APIs, but this big data project always uh, allows you to drop to the lower-level APIs to the of the data store to achieve maximum performance if you need it in this use case. So several aspects are covered um, by the Spring Data project and uh, there's also some infrastructure that's very nice, we will see it later on and also uh, some Spring Rule add-ons for these different projects. So uh, the Spring Data project is as all Spring projects and open source projects, so you find the source on, on GitHub and uh, information documentation on springsource.org and we have projects right now for Neo4j, for Redis, MongoDB and also for some SQL uh, relational databases so there's additional support for JDBC and for GPA as well. Here I want to focus on Spring Data Neo4j of course and uh, we've been collaborating with VMware for over a year now, almost one and a half a year and and uh, on top of the Neo4j basic API, uh, Spring Data Neo4j offers an improved programming model, so you just take your domain entities and annotate them as you know from, for instance, GPA. And when they are annotated, then they can be transparently mapped into the graph. We offer, also offer support for cross store persistence, where you can take an existing GPA application and add uh, a graph part of the data to it. And there's also a Spring Rule add-on, which is currently uh, updated in If you look around, your graphs are everywhere, and it's not so so difficult. You just enter a simple search term into Google Image Search, and you get lots of graphs to enjoy. And if you if you look, um, graphs and relationships are between things are everywhere, so in politics and economics, history, sciences, in transportation you have routing networks and railway networks and, and, and highways and so on. Then in all the sciences, in biology, your body is a very complex network of, of things, interconnected things. And uh, of course in the internet, in the IT, we have <coughs> systems made out of hardware that's connected, out of software that's connected, running on top of the hardware and of course the interaction with the users as well. So it's all about uh, things being connected and where the connections or relationships are very, very important. They're not just kind of uh, added on, but it's very important and you see a lot, lots of information being stored in these, in these connections. And last but not least, you also have social networks like your family, your friends, also the 
kind of offline social networks, right? They're also ex existing still. And you have uh, your work in communities. And even on a larger scale, you have your society or your city that you live in or your neighborhood. So wherever you look, it's actually graphs. It's things that are connected to each other, right? And so that's our world. Our world is a world of rich and messy data because we know that nothing is well structured in our, in our real world. And it's very interrelated and interconnected. And as I said, uh, the relationship I, at least as important as the things they connect. So um, often if you just take the things and remove all the connections, they become kind of useless because you can't reason about them anymore. So the graph is actually better than each of the parts. And graphs or, or connections also show you the complex interactions that uh, exist in the world. So it's not just a static graph, but it's always changing. So you have, uh, for one, uh, you have uh, transport of information along those relationships. And on the other hand, you also have a uh, constant change of these, of these graphs and connections. So that's very, a very important aspect because in a graph database, Relationships are part of, this, of the data, so whenever you want to change a relationship, add, add one or remove one or remove millions of relationships or add millions of relationships, you can do it easily, so there's no, nothing that prevents you from doing that and makes it hard. And in a, for instance, in a, in a relational database, uh, relationships are part, part of the fixed schema, so you have to um, add foreign key constraints, for instance, to ensure uh, data integrity. Uh, in the graph database, you also have constraints, and but there the constraint is that you don't have dangling relationships, so it doesn't happen like in the internet where you have broken links that point nowhere. In the graph database, there's always uh, it's always assured that you have uh, both ends of the relationship. Uh, there's something. Um, with a graph, uh, you can also very easily handle complex use cases. So if you have, a, for instance, a rich domain like, say, finance or retail or claim management or social networks or master data management or whatever, um, lots of domains, um, there's so much information out there and often we have to kind of cut it down or dump it down to put it or, or kind of merge it in some rigid schema. But if you are able to take the data as it is, store it, and then start asking really the, the complex questions and the interesting questions we get from our from our businesses, then we can also provide the, the answers for these questions because all or many of those answers lie between the things, between the lines. Um, we also observe that in, that in our real world, in our domains, uh, uh, information is often local, you, so you never start or you almost, almost never start in the, in the whole world, you don't shout out to the world, give me the answer to everything. And, um, but you, you start somewhere, you start at yourself, at an order, at a product, or at a user, or at a movie. And from this starting point, you kind of navigate your, your graph, so you explore your graph. And then you search for answers and search for, for instance, connected people or connected related products and so on. And so you have always a starting point and that makes it very easy to to scale for the graph database because local local operations local searches are very very cheap and very fast and only if you do graph global searches uh, they are very expensive or more expensive because you kind of have it have to iterate the whole the whole data so it's the same as you do in in other data stores when you do a for instance a full table scan or iterate over a whole key value store then it's much more expensive than uh, accessing local data. Um, we as humans also tend to categorize things, so we have all those drawers we put things on, and we that's already starting as, as young children to, to put kind of stamps on things. And so mostly we, we try to put uh, things into categories, into trees, uh, like in biology or like in your file system. Right. Uh, the problem is what happens if there's more than one category that fits. So it's quite complicated in the file system to, to do that. So fortunately there are something like symbolic links, but it really gets unwieldy to, to do that. So we invented tags 
for just tagging things and then asking for those tags. Uh, categories can be uh, represented by relationships as well. So we have, for instance, a category node in the graph database. And this, this is just connected by relationship, like an SA relationship to each item that belongs there. Uh, fortunately, any item can, ha can have any number of relationships uh, like that. So it's very easy uh, to add them and to change them. So it's, it can be part of any category. And uh, there can be also virtual relationships that are just executed as traversals. So whenever you have a, a query that expresses actually a, a relationship or a set of relationships, and you just can execute it so fast that it doesn't matter if you kind of persisted those relationships or if they are kind of just virtual, then it's very easy to, for instance, add new categories and also to keep the elements that belong to the category always up to date because you don't have to manually add or remove them from any uh, category, but they are just um, accessed via the, the query, so it's very uh, very comfortable to, to work with this. So these categories are just dynamically retrieved. So how does it work under the hood? So it's just the high-level graph talk. Now that I've got you hooked into graphs, let's look into how I would access them programmatically and how they use. What is Neo4j? So Neo4j is a graph database. Of course, we all know relational databases that's rows and columns and tables. But that's not it. It's nodes, so elements connected with uh, typed and directed relationships. The direction doesn't mean it, it's um, just a one-way thing because you can always navigate the relationship from both sides, so be from the start node or from the end node. And both nodes and relationships have an arbitrary number of key value properties which are not bound to any schema, but you can have any number of properties on one node and any number of other properties on another node. For example, there's Oliver, who is the uh, lead of the Spring Data GPA and Spring Data MongoDB project and also lives here in Dresden. And there's me. We both work together on the Spring Data project. Uh, I live in Dresden. Oliver is employed by VMware. And also we both know Rod Johnson and Oliver also likes Chinese food. So there's lots of different data in the same, in the same single graph, and this, this data allows us to, to derive uh, very, very interesting information about it. So if you kind of cut this up and create si single graphs for that, we lose lots of the richness of the domain uh, while doing that. Some facts about Neo4j. Neo4j is written in Java, so it's very, very easy to embed it in a Java uh, program like you do with HSQL, and it's a high-performance uh, Java database that uses Java NIO for memory map files for its own uh, disk format. You can also run it as a standalone server, then it offers a, a REST API and extension points where you can add your own APIs on top of that, so your own uh, REST endpoints on top of that. And Neo4j, as I said, is schema-free, so it's very, very nice for rich domains where you don't want to kind of create an all-encompassing schema covering every possibility in the world, but you just want to store what you want to store and not, nothing more. Uh, something very interesting is that uh, Neo4j is fully transactional and durable, so um, unlike other NoSQL solutions which have eventual consistency, with Neo4j you get uh, full consistency and it's like your the databases you know, right? So you have transactions and whenever the transaction commits, it's guaranteed that this data is never lost because it writes transaction logs on disk and so you don't have any problem with losing data. And it's also very fast, so you can, uh, in a single second on commodity hardware, you can uh, jump or traverse uh, more than a million relationships. And Neo4j comes with integrated indexing. The default indexing uh, library we use is Lucene, but you can also plug in other index providers. And this allows you to get uh, find your starting points when you want to work, work with the graph, do searches in the graph. Then you just uh, can specify either direct index lookups or index queries to get your starting points. We have 
an enormous amount of language bindings from Ruby to Python to uh, JavaScript, Erlang, you name it. So it's Scala, Clojure, and .NET bindings are also there. So and Neo4j has been in production since 2003 and 24-7 uh, with customers. Uh, so because it's uh, you want to see code, right? So I don't want to keep it from you any longer. And uh, how would it look like to, to use Neo4j itself? So you just create a embedded graph database that's a, a singleton access instance to your graph database, so it's shareable, it's thread safe. You just can pass it around and use it from, from as many threads as you like. And then you use uh, this graph database to create your nodes, set properties on those nodes, and create relationships, and so on. As new for js transaction, all write access has to be wrapped in a transaction. So it would like, look like this. And you have a traversal framework that allows you to start at a certain point in the graph and then traverse the graph uh, going through it, for instance. Uh, find all dependencies of A transitively. So we start from A to B, then go to C, and also from B to D to the end, right? So we have uh, C and D as results of that. So that's done with a traversal framework that has a, a DSL-like declaration of the traversal, which you then just execute on the start node, and then it traverses the graph lazily and you just pull pull the results through an iterator or an iterable and do whatever you want to do in the results. So it's very configurable so you can uh, put in your own uh, callbacks uh, to work with Neo4j traversals. You start uh, to, uh, with the start node by indexing. For instance, you can find a node named David and then you can start traversing. Uh, a feature that we introduced this year into Neo4j and which has been immensely pop popular is the query language. It's called Cypher. And it's actually a declarative query language that says what you want to do and not how it's done under the hood. So, for instance, I've got two examples here. In the first example, I start with a someone called David. And then I look for its friends of his friends. So, not his, just his friends but uh, the friends of those friends as well. So I follow the nose relationships twice to go to his friends of friends, and I, I'm all only interested in those friends that are older than 18 and return them. So I get back a, a stream of friends of friends of friends, and that's, uh, if I would write this in, in Java code, it would be like spend the whole page at least, I think. And uh, for the, uh, the second example is you start uh, with a set of nodes, uh, with node IDs, and just find the friends and can aggregate over those. So we can see how many friends has a user and how much money they have. And it would be also possible to, to sort this and, and limit the results. So it's very convenient to execute also ad hoc uh, complex graph queries with a very descriptive and um, visually uh, visually impressive language that also other people, for instance, from the business side can easily understand. So as I've already shown, there's the Traversal API and there are graph algorithms where you can do things like routing and path finding and so on. And the rest in the Neo4j server, there's the REST API and the extensions. And for the uh, uh, more production oriented uh, application for, of Neo4j. We have also a high availability mode where you can build clusters of Neo4j servers also for um, improving read performance by uh, recharting and things like online backup monitoring and so on is also in there, of course. So that was the quick Trump's jump through those topics. And now we want to dive into Spring Data Neo4j. I hope that you don't have too many questions so far. I just have a quick look. And let's see. Oops. We have two questions. Um, yes. I don't know if you want to talk about them now or... I would just have want to have a look because uh, if something... Um, 
but the go to webinar doesn't show them so well. Can you perhaps read them to me, Alison? Yeah, sure. Okay, the first question is um, how is the best easy way to import data into Neo4j from a native SQL database like MySQL, like my MS SQL? Uh, could we use the transaction API? Uh, yes, you can, of course. Uh, use the transactional API. So, for instance, if you're using Spring, you can just uh, pull up a GDB, JDBC template within a transaction and pull the data out of the uh, SQL database and put it into Neo4j. That's very easy. Uh, so, as uh, Spring and Neo4j also can share all the uh, Spring transaction APIs. That's, that's no problem. Okay. The second um, Yeah, then there's the second one and the last one that is here for now is uh, if there's time, can you speak to any advantages, disadvantages implementing embedded or standalone? Yeah. Okay, I I think I covered it at the end uh, because uh, that's um, a broader topic. Topic. So then let's dive into Spring Data New for j so first, there are lots of conveniences that come with the Spring framework itself. So from being the default enterprise development framework, it's also employed by VMware as the future Java's cloud stack. So uh, Cloud Foundry supports it, and Heroku supports Spring deployments, and all other cloud providers like uh, Red Hat, OpenShift also deploy it. Um, Spring kind of favored a project-centric application design where we have uh, rich projects and then uh, facets uh, in front of them. Uh, Spring also made SPECJ socially acceptable, which is really interesting, um, uh, mostly with the transaction management and at configurable annotations. Uh, something that's very convenient in Spring is the template programming model that offers you a nice uh, facet to underlying services, like GDZ template, for instance. Uh, of course, the inversion of control uh, dependency injection is very convenient to, to use as well and also nice for testing. We now have Spring Java config and with Spring 3.1 even more ways of doing uh, interesting things there with uh, profiles and environments and so on. We have XML nas namespaces which also are quite quite convenient to configure stuff that would be very, very complex and, and um, loaded with just pure XML configuration. And Spring also comes with a lot, a lot of powerful libraries and abstractions, so all the web stack, all the Spring Batch and Spring integration, and the JDBC uh, libraries and so on. And of course, Spring brings along the Spring Data project, which we are part of, which is really cool. So uh, a fun fact at the beginning, so Spring Data Neo 4 j is the brainchild of Rod Johnson and Emil Ephraim, our CEO. So they came together, so Emil Ping wrote about uh, NoSQL and about Neo4j, and they came together and wrote the initial prototype. And um, we then started on top of that and continued to, to develop the library and expand it in different directions and add functionality and the scope as well. Um, yeah, another fun fact is that uh, Rod Johnson is now the chairman of the board of New Technology. So he really seems to be convinced that uh, NoSQL graph database is, is a good way to go in the future. Um, Spring Data in Neo4j uses annotation, as I said, to define entities, and we are backing those entities by the graph database. We have two modes. First, we started with the uh, advanced mapping mode, which uses SPECJ uh, to map objects transparently to the graph. Uh, but, but as we got lots of requests of people that don't want to use SPJ or that have uh, problems with that, we also added a simple POJO-based graph mapping that just uh, copies data out of the graph and into your entities. And we have uh, the Spring Go add-on. There are lots of features. We will cover many of them, so I don't read this uh, slide. Um, so what did uh, Spring, uh, what did um, entities look like before uh, Spring Data and Neo4j came along. So we have already seen the uh, Neo4j API and it's quite verbose, so it's low level and very fast, but also quite verbose. So if you are used to using POJOs and having clean code, then it's uh, lots of boilerplate and, and, and big code, so 
you already can see here that there's an actor which has an underlying node, so that's kind of the connection to the graph database. And every property access is just delegated to this node. Uh, that's the same approach the SPJ mode uses, so it, uh, but it employs, of course, SPJ magic to do this, so to intercept field access and to redirect this field access to uh, properties of the node. Uh, the same, uh, or and it more even more advanced, uh, Spring Data Info J uh, class would look like this. So you just have the actor annotated and the property and here we even have uh, auto-indexing of this name field added, so you can, whenever you, you change the name, it's indexed for this actor, and whenever you want to uh, look for the actor, you can use the name index for that. Um, relationships, you already saw an example of navigating relationships, it doesn't get better. So in the, in the middle you see the, the old version, the existing version that you use with the core Neo4j API, and down there you see an annotation on a on a single uh, movies set, so from actors to movies, and uh, that's it. So that's all you need. So you define entity classes by annotating them. So a node entity represents a node in a graph. Uh, all its fields are saved as properties on the nodes, and relationships are stored as uh, references to other entities are stored as relationships between nodes. You just instantiate it with new and then when you save it, it's persisted to the graph. And these entities are also returned by lookup me mechanisms like uh, index searches or traversals or cipher queries. Uh, to provide some more convenience, we also store some type of information in the graph, which allows you to just get a bunch of nodes from the graph and then convert them automatically into correct entities. Uh, for relationship entities, it's similar. Fortunately, in Neo4j, relationships are not just uh, dumped down arrows between things, but they are re all, uh, really rich objects which have, have their own state and type and directions as well. And so uh, these first level citizens of the graph database are also represented by, or can be represented if you want to, uh, by their own uh, domain entities. So you can annotate them. Uh, the same goes for their fields and they have special fields for their start, start and end nodes. So that's what I, as I already shown, what a, what a domain entity would look like. And you have conversions for non-primitive, non non-native fields, like for instance, this hair color is an enum, which is then converted to a string representation. And uh, relationship fields like uh, from person to movie, is automatically handled as a relationship field, so even don't have to annotate it. And uh, sets of, oh, no, um, relationships in the other direction, you just annotate with an incoming direction and use the same type. So uh, the top actor from the movie is the same relationship in the, from, uh, for the top actor in uh, field, in the actor. So they, it's just navigated in the other direction. So for sets of entities, it's also a simple annotation that you put on top, and you can provide a type. Otherwise, the field name is used as with other property uh, with all the properties. You uh, it defaults to the field name as the property name, but you can provide your own uh, property name if you want to do it. For relationship entities, uh, for instance, here between a movie and an actor, I have, have a role, which has the start and the end node as special fields, which might be there but don't have to be there depending on the mapping mode. And then you have an, an arbitrary number of other properties in your relationship entity. And for the actual node entity class that contains those relationship entities, it's also just an related to wire annotation on top of the uh, collection. So, indexing, uh, you just put an indexed annotation on top of a property. It's also possible to configure more complex stuff um, with this indexed annotations, for instance, index names or full text indexes and so on. And 
then you would just go to a repository and ask it for, for instance, actors or uh, whatever you want to ask for and use this as a starting point for your operation with the graph database. So we also have uh, spatial searches and, and uh, full text uh, searches which are analyzed by Lucene and you can use uh, the Lucene query language to do uh, more complex index lookups and traversals are also supported either by putting annotations on fields that are then executed when the field is accessed or the entity is loaded and you can provide a class that encapsulates a transaction uh, a traversal uh, description uh, to, to iterate over the graph. That's also a nice example for dynamic field computation so whenever you put an annotation like this or a query annotation on top of a field then it will be a kind of a virtual field that doesn't really exist but it's just backed by a computation like for instance a graph traversal or a query. Here are two examples for uh, cipher queries on top of fields. Yeah, you just put uh, the query which is uh, defaults to the actual instance for the self parameter and then you have uh, an arbitrary complex uh, cipher query on top of this field and the results of this query are returned as the content of this field. So for the simple uh, mapping approach we just take the uh, infrastructure that's in Spring Data Commons which uh, extracts and provides all the meta information about the entities, so which entities are there, which fields do they have, what types of the fields, and enriches those with um, much more information than just the basic reflection API does. And so we added uh, some means around this for, for instance, cascading reads and uh, controlling fetch, uh, fetching of um, related entities. And uh, with the uh, simple project mapping, you actually extract or copy the data out of the graph and uh, put it into the entity so it's detached when it's loaded. And uh, you can use it in other layers, for instance, any web layer, without any uh, problems regarding se open session in view or something similar. And you would use the Neo4j template for graph interactions as well. So with the advanced mapping mode with SBJ, it does uh, some things. So first it does the uh, intercepts the field access. As I said, so it will redirect reads and writes of fields to uh, node properties. If it's an attached entity, so if it there's actually a node or relationship uh, attached to this entity, it will add two interfaces to these uh, entities and introduce some convenience methods as, as well. So we will pull these additional methods to an active record max in so that the uh, pure advanced mapping will just do the field access which is transparent and uh, behaves like also the uh, enhanced classes with Hibernate do. Uh, there are some tooling issues around SPECJ. So with STS there's no problem. Uh, JetBrains promised full support for the SPECJ stuff we need in IntelliJ 11, so they, they didn't make it and I complained about it, so we will have perhaps in 11.1 uh, the full SPECJ support in IntelliJ IDEA. Actually there's no problem in the, in the build system, so either you use Maven or Gradle or ARNT or IV or any other build system, because for most of the, these build systems SPECJ plugins exist and so it's quite easy to, to build your stuff and even if your IDE doesn't complain, uh, doesn't comply every time with the with the build results. So, and there's much more, but I want to show uh, the rest of these things inside of the IDE, so that you'll see that I'm not just talking stuff. Um, if you look at the documentation of Spring Data Neo4j, you will find that's a guidebook which is uh, due to be published at InfoQ in the next weeks. And um, the guidebook consists of two parts. The first part is an introduction, it's, it's, a, it's a tutorial 
that shows you how to build a social movie database called Zinnias uh, with Spring Data Near4j. And we have an example sample code for that in, in both map, mapping modes. And actually, Zinnias runs on the inter internet, so what I can do is I can go there, zinnias.net, for instance, search for movies, I can look at movies, I can uh, look at the actors in the, in the movie, see which other movies they have played in. And I can also, uh, for instance, see that movies are rated, like Matrix here. There are different people who rated those. Uh, I can have a user model and it uses Spring Security for it, all the user related stuff. So I can log in, have a personal screen and whenever I have also friends, so it's also the social aspect of this uh, movie database is in there. And it uses uh, ratings for, uh, it shows my ratings, the movies I rated, so I can uh, down here I see what I said about movies and actually this is uh, Matrix Reloaded which was not so good. And here I can just uh, change the rating if, if I want to, for instance. So if I go to my home screen again I see also that um, I get suggestions. So for instance I look which other movies have they rated and did, did I didn't rate so far, so that I probably haven't seen so far. So I find kind of like-minded people and from those like-minded people I uh, trace back to those movies they have rated favorably uh, but which I haven't seen, so that's where the recommendations come from. So that's how the uh, application looks like and if we dive into the code we can start at, for instance, at the user the user has a login which is indexed to find it at login. Then it has a name and password of course, it has security roles for admin stuff and more interestingly it has ratings, so these are movies that has, have been rated and it also has friends, the user object. So if you look at the, so in the friends there are just other user objects, so the actual relationship uh, between uh, two users is not at least in this application, not uh, so important. So we could, for instance, if it was important for us, we could store when it started, for instance, the friendship and how good it is and how dear friends we are. Uh, but for the movie, it's interesting because we have the, the rating relationship to the movie. So the rating is actually a relationship entity uh, which has a movie and a user as start and end nodes. And in the rating relationship, we have also the stars that you give a movie and the command. That's what you've seen at the, uh, down here. So the stars and the command over there. And uh, you can also access the movie and the user, of course. So that means I'm now in the movie. And the movie is of course also a node entity, has an ID which is external because we pull the data from the movie DB which has a free movie data set that you can pull via an API. And then we can uh, search for movie titles as you've seen and this is a full text search so it's analyzed uh, full text and splits down the, uh, the titles and removes uninteresting uh, keywords and so on. And I can also do white code searches. And then the movie has of course a director which is also a node entity uh, because it um, inherits from person and the person has uh, an actor and a, a director as sub entities and then it has a set of actors which uh, have the acts in relationship here as incoming so from the actor there points a relationship to the movie so it's an incoming relationship here and we also have the roles that uh, are played in this movie so then we have a bunch of other attributes as well and just some some getters for that. So this is just the entities that are in there. So how would how would I use them? So as this is a web application, uh, they are typically used in the uh, 
in the controller. So you just annotate your controller and um, then you use have your um, controller methods that you probably already know. Uh, for instance, for the single movie view, which is movie movie ID, which is this, exactly this uh, view, there's the movie ID, and this is the, the movie's context. I just get the movie ID as a pass variable. I can ask the repository for that. And here it gets interesting. First, where does, the, does this repository come from? Let's have a look at the movie repository. And more importantly, where does the implementation come from? Because we don't see any implementation here. So Spring Data Neo4j repository is built upon the infrastructure that's provided by uh, the Spring Data Commons project and which provides a repository infrastructure for all Spring Data projects and which allows you to compose repositories out of several kind of traits or parts and provides default implementations for many of those methods. So a uh, movie repository is first and foremost a, a graph repository. That means um, that's a class from Spring Data Neo 4J. And the graph repository is a crutch repository and is also a index repository and triple repository. And the crutch repository brings along methods like uh, save, like find one, like find all, delete and delete all, and find page, for instance. So uh, all, the, all, all of those methods are already implemented in Spring Data Neo4j, so you don't have to implement them yourself. And um, the repository interface that you declared will use this implementation that's provided by the library automatically. So you don't have to write any implementation code for these uh, kind of boilerplate operations. Uh, but actually, we didn't use the, uh, these methods here that we've just seen, but we used something different. And if you look at the controller, it says find by ID. But first, we probably want to look at the place where the um, repositories are set up and configured. So we just have a quick look into the application context, which contains just two important lines. So of course, um, annotation config and component scan to find annotated entities, it's not so important. The two important lines are these. The first one configures Spring Data Neo4j. So if I don't use repository, that's all I need to, to put into my configuration uh, to configure Spring Data Neo4j. So as a default, I just provide a store directory, but I can also provide a actual graph database instance as a bean reference, which can then be configured with more, with more uh, detailed configuration. And the second config is for the repositories where it just says this is the base package of my repositories and find them and create, please create injectable beans out of those interface uh, declarations and then uh, just inject them at the appropriate places. So the movie repository is exactly in this package and in the movie controller I just let um, the spring context inject this movie repository here. So I don't have to care about um, creating an instance of that myself. So I can use the uh, repository in a number of ways. So we can call all the methods of that. And when I want to I look at the find by ID method, for instance, I uh, look at it and I don't see an implementation and I don't see any, any anything else. So when I don't have an implementation and I don't, don't have any annotation, then the repository infrastructure uh, assumes that's a derived final. So you probably know from uh, Rails or Grails this uh, way of taking just a method name and some additional information, like here we have the type information that's about a movie. And uh, if you have the, all the meta information that we already extracted out of the class and all its properties and all its relationship, then we can use those properties uh, to look at the method name and see what uh, you, the developer, actually want to, to do with this method. So it says find by ID. So that's so defined by is just ignored and it just says ID. So we want to query for ID. And we also have exactly one parameter, which is core. And we return a movie. So that's all the information the method gives us. So if you look at the movie, actually, 
uh, it has an ID property that's cool otherwise it would would fail so that then uh, the application would fail at startup and say no this um, repository method is not valid because that's a property that's not inside the movie clause and you also see that's an indexed uh, field so we use actually what we do here is Yes, repository. There is a repository. What we do here is um, we create a cipher query behind the scenes, which is looks like that. Start movie equals index lookup. Index lookup of a parameter and return movie. Nothing complicated. A similar repository method would look like um, that. Find by property value id comma id so up here that this is cipher query that we generated behind the scene and this would be the appropriate repository method that would you would call when you want to do it manually uh, but find by is much nicer and much more expressive than that um, the same goes for here find by title like title is also an attribute of movie and it's also full text attribute so we can do white card queries and the like denotes these uh, white card query like uh, abilities. Here's also a page ever passed in that's a class from Spring Data Commons which uh, encapsulates page uh, offsets with page size and page numbers so that this message retains it turns a page of movies so for instance for web application it's very nice to to have something like that uh, to implement paging. So in the controller, when we look at the uh, uh, movies, find movies method, which takes a query from a query param, uh, we just call find by title like and pass in a pitch request because we just want to see 20 movies on the first page. So I didn't implement like jumping pages here, but just the first page. And then I get back a, a page of movies which just uh, encapsulates a list and some additional meta information about us and then I can uh, act on top of that. And then with each of those controller methods I just put the information into the model and then use a GSP to render those. That's about it code wise and I quickly want to finish the presentation which covers repository as we've, as we've seen uh, Neo4j template is a template that uh, provides lots of convenience methods to access the um, Neo4j graph database. What's interesting, it has not an explosion of methods like JDBZ template, but it rather has affluent result handling, so it returns just result objects which then have a kind of small DSL to convert those results to something, to a different type. and um, so that means that we have much less methods to, to deal with. And it's also, also nice that it works transparently with a Neo4j REST server. So you don't have to do something completely different, but it will just forward your, um, your method calls of the Neo4j API to the server uh, using the REST API. So these are some examples. Uh, the server support is here, and we had this question about the server support. Um, so of course there's a difference because you have network uh, and network latency involved and serialization and deserialization of of data. And uh, so the, the REST API is uh, slower than the embedded API. Uh, but what you can do if you want to have the highest performance possible, you can write a server extension or server plugin, even with Spring Data in Neo4j. And uh, from this server extension, you can just, then just provide your custom domain level endpoints with your custom protocol to expose only the data you want to expose and only um, and also encapsulate the whole request in a single transaction and do uh, the application logic logic near the actual graph database so it's very high performant and just expose the results of that. So as I said we can write uh, extensions with Spring Data in E4J and we can also uh, make uh, things from the Spring world injectable in, into the Jersey world, which is very convenient uh, if I can get some beans injected. Uh, I won't talk about cross-store persistence because we almost have no time. 
anymore. But I will talk about about uh, rule a bit. So there was a rule book by uh, Josh Long and Steve Maystack published at uh, Bauer Riley at OSCON, which was contains a chapter about the Spring Data Neo4j rule add on. But this rule add on, which will be used like this for generating entities and, and fields and relationships, um, will get a major overhaul in the next weeks, probably in January. And then it will be compatible with Spring Data Neo4j 2.0 and also with the repository abstractions and so on. Uh, I've already talked about the guidebook and also about the SNES demo. So that's it from my side. I would like to ask Alison for the questions that we've got so far. We don't have that much time anymore, but perhaps you can answer at least yeah. some of them. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, there's uh, one kind of a comment and then there's one question, uh, okay. both from Clive. The uh, first comment is um, that he has a polyglot hunch that Neo4j powers the Salesforce.com chatter via Heroku globally EC, EC2 replicated. Do you have any comments on that? That sounds very interesting. But I don't know what's, what's hunch. I'm not a native English speaker. Oh, he has a feeling that uh, Salesforce.com chatter may be powered by Neo for <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> um, so we are, we are um, working closely with Heroku. That's true, uh, but I don't know of uh, Salesforce.com uh, powering chatter with Neo 4 J. But it would be cool. Perhaps they do, and they didn't tell us. So I don't know. <laughs> okay. And um, yes. And the second one. Yeah, the second is: um, Is there a sample app available for Neo 4 J? Yeah, uh, uh, so we have this sample app for Spring Data Neo4j that I've shown you that's uh, part of the uh, Spring Data Neo4j uh, code base. So you can just pull it from GitHub for both mapping modes, uh, for simple mapping and advanced mapping, and also for the REST server access. And there are also sample apps for Neo4j available. Uh, they live in the uh, GitHub slash Neo4j examples directory. And there are also sample apps from other people uh, who wrote, for instance, uh, applications that uh, use a Twitter stream for uh, visualization or applications that use bioinformatics, for instance, Bio4j is an example that's an open source bio database. And their structure, which is an open source CMS using Neo4j, it's all on GitHub. And there's also, for instance, Transport Dublin, which is a routing service for Dublin uh, public transport, which is based on Neo4j. And all of those projects are on uh, public uh, open source on GitHub, so you can pull them and have a look at them and uh, use this as inspiration for your for your projects. Yeah, so then I would like to thank you for your time and uh, hope we could show you some of the applications of Spring Data Neo4j. And uh, the powers look really in a simplicity. Uh, you just take your entities, annotate them, get them stored into the graph, can retrieve them, can, you can pass them to other frameworks that expect POJOs, for instance. Um, and then if you need to, you can still drop down to the raw near the API level and have high-speed traversals, for instance, through your millions and billions of nodes and relationships. All right. Thanks Thank so you very much, Michael. And thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar. Uh, stay tuned. Tomorrow we'll be sending out the recorded version of this webinar. And coming up in January, we have a, a new batch of webinars. So look out for those. All right. Well, have a great rest of the day. And um, see you soon. Bye-bye.